Hello Pokemon trainers and welcome back to top 16 of the Women's Tournament 2. It's myself and Gabby Snyder here behind the desk. We're going to be taking you through the Pokemon action for top 16, which I can't wait for. We've been able to battle out the Swiss rounds yesterday. We saw a phenomenal top 32 match. It's just going to keep getting better and better. It really is. I mean, we're slowly getting closer and closer to the top. Um, we'll be featuring one match from top 16, one match from top eight, and then both of the top four matches. And I feel like every time we take a step up the ladder, it's just going to get more and more exciting and more and more cutthroat as everybody's tournament lines are really lives are really being forced mm -hmm. on the line. Um, there are so many exciting teams and so many uh, unique takes on cores that we've seen traditionally in past GS Cups in this tournament. And I'm really excited about the next matchup because it's, again, like one of these, a couple of these sort of classic teams, one a bit mm -hmm. newer than the other, uh, but both of them have unique takes by their trainers. So I'm so excited to watch these two players uh, play it out. Exactly. And one of the things that was asked in the downtime as well in the chat, you guys know we like to have an interactive question, which was this time, what is your favorite legendary Pokemon from Generation 8? Now, I'm very passionate about this one. There is a clear winner for me. <laughs> the happiest, brightest, bounciest boy, Regieleki, is just amazing. I absolutely love that Pokemon. I think the design's incredible, but also the sheer power of it. It's one of the Pokemon that I've taken to while running um, actually a Series 8 Team, and I love just being able to Dynamax it off the bat as well. Take down all of those water types that are running around, set that electric to train, stop any sports shenanigans from going down. I just feel like it's been a really good partner in crime. What about you, Gabby? It's really tough for me to say. Um, I think that a lot of the Gen 8 legendaries have really interesting designs and, you know, certainly have interesting competitive options to them. Um, I think, honestly, Zacian or Zacian uh, comes mm -hmm. out a little bit on top for me just because, uh, you know, it's good in both the TCG and the VG uh, formats right now, which is kind of exciting. I think it's mm -hmm. very rare for a Pokemon to do that. Um, but also, there was a moment when it was first announced where uh, everybody was just making fun of how Zashin would just be carrying like you know random objects around instead of the <laughs> rusted sword that it brings into battle which I just think is neat you know what let let the dog have his toys and you know he, he's a good dog they're, they're all oh, good yeah. dogs but Zashin's like a specially good dog 100% so. <laughs> and it's gotta have as well you gotta give it some toys to play with you know it'll bring the sword yeah. to battle when you need it but it's still a puppy at heart um, but I think it's a really good choice as well because in the particular competitive format I think when we started introducing these restrictors a lot of people were like Xerneas that'll be the cool because you can just go for that Geomancy boost up be super powerful um, and Zashin actually is a really hard counter to Xerneas having that steel typing having an um, intrepid sword to be able to boost up your attack while entering a battlefield is going to be something that Xerneas is going to have quaking on its pointy little toes so it's going to be interesting to see if those pokemon do come up against each other how they're going to interact well, I, I have some exciting news for you, Lou. That might happen a little bit more quickly than you think, uh, because I, I have some uh, some information that we'll be featuring Mogar versus Lucky in this round of Top 16. And Lucky, as we saw on stream yesterday, did bring a Xerneas team along mm -hmm. with some of its friends from the past coming back to play once again. And Mogar has been running a interesting team, uh, their own take on the Zacian, or Zacian and Lapras combination. So... Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm really excited to see this match play out. You know, I think that both these trainers have options, you know, when it comes to taking down the opposites restricted Pokemon. But more importantly, you know, again, going back to what we were talking about previously, both of these trainers have put their own twist on these cores that have emerged as, you know, being popular in Series 8. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you're Xerneas in all of the restricted formats ever for all time. So I'm very excited to watch these two trainers uh, duke it out. We have gotten word that they are in team preview. So maybe we should uh, go over the matchup a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Well, if we take a look at Mogar's team, their signature Pokemon is Raichu, and I'm not surprised to see that on the <laughs> pairing of the six. There's Raichu, Landorus, Incineroar, Rillaboom, Lapras, and Zacian. So really interesting Fireball to Grass call coming out from that side of the field. And on the opposing side, on Lucky side, there is going to be the Rotom Wash, Amoongus, Xerneas, Incineroar, Landorus, and Metagross. So you're right, Gabby, those two Restricteds are going to be coming to play. Yeah, and it's also kind of funny that only the Zashin is the only Pokemon from Sword and Shield to make an appearance <laughs> in this battle. I guess the Rillaboom as well. I'm sorry, Rillaboom. I just mistook mm -hmm. you for Tapu Bulu. I think it happens a lot recently. <laughs> um, but 
you know, looking at this matchup and, and looking at a Zashin team in particular, a lot of Zashin teams right now tend to build around having the Lapras go for the Gigantamax and then immediately set up G-Max Resonance so that the Zashin is able to take a few more of those hits. You know, in Lucky's favor, they do have Landorus Therian and Metagross on her team, which uh, do get access to like high horsepower, Earthquake, those ground type moves that can hit it super effectively. But she's going to have to be very careful that she's able to play them in a way where they don't get knocked out by that Lapras, by the Incineroar, or by Mogar's Landorus Therian. Uh, so we're going to have to pay attention to, you know, what Pokemon are on the field when and a lot of defensive switching. Because I think that's going to be key as this game gets going. Yeah, Lapras, the model for paintings that's come out in its beautiful shiny form there for Mogar is definitely a devious Pokemon, even if it doesn't last too long in the field necessarily. Um, if it's able to be able to go for that G-Max Resonance and set up the Aurora Veil, then it's still going to have done a pretty good job. It's out here front with the Raichu, you're going to be able to redirect any electric type attacks, but Lucky has gone for Metagross and Incineroar. I, I just got to nerd out for a bit here. Uh, you know, <laughs> as I've mentioned on the stream, I've been doing a ribbon quest and uh, the model for paintings is actually only unlockable in Gen 3 and you have to win like an absurd amount of contests in order to do Ooh. so. So just shout outs to Mogar for bringing that Lapras all the way back from Gen 3 <laughs> up until this battlefield today. Like, I, I don't care what happens in this matchup at this point. I feel <laughs> like they should just pat themselves on the bat for that dedication alone. Um, and also for making it this far in this tournament. Uh, a very good start for Mogar having that Raichu next to the Lapras. While Lightning Rod isn't uh, as important right now, the fact is that Mogar does have the faster fake out on the field. And as a result, sort of forces that Incineroar to switch out so the Lapras doesn't get a little bit too confident with an immediate knockout. Yeah, and the Among Us coming in there for Lucky. Again, it's... It's an interesting choice because if you go for something like a G-Max Resonance, then that's going to be able to pick up a lot of damage against the Amoongas, quite potentially pick up the KO as well, depending on the item choice on that Lapras. Um, but again, if you are maybe going for a Max Geyser straight off the bat, trying to remove that Incineroar from the field, Amoongas is going to be much more suited to be able to take it. But in this game one of top 16, there's going to be a Dynamax apiece in this very first turn. Gigantamax Lapras is up on the field for Malcolm, and for Lucky, it's going to be that Metagross. And again, Metagross is a Pokemon that can really kind of put the Lapras into check, going for some of those Max Steel Spikes, boosting up the defense as well to help counteract against some of the rest of the Pokemon on Malcolm's scene, such as that Landorus and Incineroal can be really helpful to that Metagross, but it is going to be paralyzed by that pesky little Raichu, going to be able to go and nuzzle away at it. Lapras is going to be in prime position to go for that G-Max Resonance, and it has actually connected into what was the Incineroal, going to be taking down this Amoongus. Huge, huge damage, and what a game prediction there by Malcolm, knowing that the Incineroar was very likely to switch out here and is able to capitalize on that immensely. Um, and Moongus is going to hang on. Metagross is going to be able to go for that Max Quake powers through any potential paralysis, does a tiny little bit of damage to the Lapras, but I think the critical thing here is boosting up that special defense in the face of two special attackers. I love the nuzzle play from Raichu into the Metagross. You know, we talk so much about speed control in Series 8. Uh, nuzzle is just another one of those options. Unlike Electro Web, will not hit both of your targets, but uh, will stick around for the entirety of the match, along with giving your opponent a 30% chance to not move in the turn. Um, definitely a little bit harder to pilot, but as you can see, just connects with the Metagross and forces it to move after the Lapras is able to set up G-Max Resonance. So really great synergy there. I like the switch into the Amoongus on Lucky's side of the field. I think that the Amoongus uh, will help redirect a couple of the attacks away from the Metagross, but it's just not going to be doing a lot of damage at this point. And Lapras mm -hmm. is free to, you know, figure out what uh, the next priority for it is. It might be getting rain up on the field so that fire type attacks won't do as much as the Zashin. Uh, it might be just going for those G-Max Ren... Uh, resonances to deal more damage. Uh, it's really, you know, Mogar's call. Well, Raichu, you're going to use Helping Hand to boost up this second G-Max Resonance as this time is going to catch on to that Xerneas that has switched in. Does a huge chunk of damage, goes over 50%. But I like the switch out, you know, Amoongo's going to be able to use its regenerator ability and get a little bit more HP to come back into this game as Metagross goes for a Nullet Max Quake. So Metagross is going to be sitting at plus two special defense and the Xerneas is going to get a spe special defense boost as well. But I like the way that Malcolm is just completely ignoring this Metagross here. Knows it can't do a lot of damage. You're not going to be able to pick up a KO against it or anything like that. You might as well wait until it goes back down to its normal size and there's a possible pokemon that malcolm will have to be able to deal with that metagross later on 
Exactly. Like, Metagross is definitely not the threat at this point in time. And as long as you're able to keep dealing massive damage to whatever is next to it, uh, once the Dynamax is over for both the Lapras and the Metagross, you're going to be in a great spot. Zerny is going to go for a Protect here as well. Protecting herself from a potential Nuzzle, which is exactly what Raichu has done here. Just wants to share the love across this entire battlefield here. And Lapras using his last turn of Dynamax to go for that Max Geyser. I think this is really wise. As you mentioned, Gabby, the rain's now going to be set up onto the field, allowing that Zashin a little bit of protection from any Fire-type moves, but it will also boost, of course, the Water-type moves coming out from that Lapras a little bit later on. Zerny is going to take a minimal amount of damage. It's going to hang around into that next turn. And Max Quake coming out once again from this Metagross wanting to make sure that special defense is super high on Lucky's side of the field. You know, at this point, it's almost like the Metagross has gotten up a light screen of its own, but unfortunately, <laughs> that will go away as soon as Lucky decides to switch out those Pokemon or they're knocked out. So, you know, I think that the Lapras used its Dynamax a little bit more effectively than the Metagross, but uh, still a very good start for the game for both these trainers. Xerni is not going to be able to do much since it's taken so much damage already. I don't think it would be wise for it to go for a Geomancy. You're not going to stick around even with the special mm -hmm. defense boosts you've gotten already and you have to assume that in the back mogar does have that Zash that zashin or maybe even that rillaboom to deal damage on the physical side of things as well so uh if i were in lucky's shoes i think i would start to figure out what other pokemon i have access to that can help me win this game uh the metagross it's going to be able to do some damage but that paralysis is definitely going to haunt it you know the amoongus could redirect could put things to sleep on mogar our side of the field we haven't seen any attempt at electric terrain or any sort of attempt to mitigate that sleep status so getting mm. a spore down onto the raichu or possibly onto the lapras may give lucky the opportunity to go for a geomancy or otherwise find another pokemon to deal some big damage well, there's nothing stopping Raichu at the moment for going for these nuzzles. And Lapras able to connect the Hydra Pump. It's going to go into the Amoongus, though, that has switched in. So going to be able to take that much better than um, the Xerneas would have done. Iron Head coming out into Raichu. Able to survive. It's not very effective. Uh, but I think the critical thing here as well is that Amoongus has come in. It doesn't have, like you mentioned, any of those special defense boosts that the Metagross was setting up. So sort of any potential Ice-type move, like a Freeze Try, it's going to be able to do a good chunk of damage. It, it is, and I think that you have to prioritize getting the knockout on the uh, Amoongus here so that it doesn't go for any spores, you know. It was going to be slower than the Lapras and the Raichu regardless of that paralysis, so I think it's a nice to have, but you can't rely on paralysis to stop something like Spore, especially when it's so threatening to your lead. Well, we saw the paralysis come into play there, allowing Raichu to be able to do a little bit of damage onto that opposing Metagross and return to its trainer. Um, Zashin is going to be coming out here, and in the rain, this is actually a perfect opportunity to start capitalizing on the fact that both of these Pokemon are paralyzed. There's going to be a lot of those kind of slow slow starts, maybe not even a start at all if the full paralysis comes through. And with Amoongus uh, being removed from the field as well by that freeze dry it does mean that there isn't going to be any risk of pokemon going to see it's actually going to be a double paralysis there for lucky. that's so unfortunate but you did say gabby that it could come back to haunt her it, it can and it will and that's unfortunately what nuzzle does um i think that a lot of people have been focusing on electro web just because i, I think people think about regi and they think about oh yeah regi lucky is a great electro web user raichu is almost as fast you know i'll just go for electro web on raichu but I think, honestly, Nuzzle is the preferred mode of speed control for Raichu, if only because of the paralysis chance. You know, we've seen it mm. uh, really give Malcolm the opportunity to take a commanding lead with the Lapras, with the, Z with the Zashin. And even though Incineroar is on the field now and did get the Intimidate to remove the plus one attack bonus we saw Zashin take on its way in, you know, it's staring down two Pokemon that can hit it very hard. So it's, it's going to be an uphill battle for Lucky. Fake out, going to stop the Zashin from doing anything spectacular this turn, but these Hydro Pumps are finding their mark for the Lapras. Connect into that Incineroar. In the rain, there's no doubt about it. That's going to be able to pick up the KO against the Incineroar, and it's going to be leaving the field almost as quickly as it joined. Metagross going for an Iron Head here. Going to do a decent chunk to that Lapras. It is starting to tick away at its HP, but I think Lapras has done more than enough work in this particular game so far. I think as well, having that resonance up, um, particularly the sort of the light clay variant there on the Lapras, is going to be able to have that longevity out on the field and protect the rest of Malcolm's team as these turns start to unfold. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what Lapras wants to do in really any matchup. You know, I think its most popular partner right now is going to be that Zacian, but we saw in the last round of Swiss yesterday, Yoko used a Lapras paired with a Necrozma Duskmane. So really, if you have a Pokemon that can hit very hard but needs the extra bulky support, uh, Lapras is the perfect Pokemon to consider right now. Most of these Lapras will have Water Absorb as an ability to take advantage of Kyogre's popularity, and it's just so easy to fit onto a team, especially when you don't have to worry about contention for your Dynamax Pokemon. Well, Zerni is just going to protect in the face of this Zashin and Lapras going for another move I haven't seen in a long time. That <laughs> Perish song. So all the Pokemon on the field, if they stay in, will fake at the end of three turns. And as Lucky is down to her last remaining two Pokemon, it's going to be a tight situation. It's going to be pinned in to hear that song and close out the game. Whereas Malcolm, they have the opportunity to keep switching their Pokemon and reset the perishing sounds of that song. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned that you haven't seen this in a while because for whatever reason, Perish Song is probably one of the most popular moves on Lapras right now, uh, which is very unique compared to other formats where GMAX Lapras has been popular. Mm -hmm. I think it's because there's so many Pokemon around right now that do focus on bulk so that they can take the heavy hits that Pokemon like Zacian or Kyogre or Groudon bring. Uh, but a lot of Lapras, if they're running Perish Song, they do not have any electric type move coverage. So mm -hmm. That's going to be important to keep in mind when we go into game two. One of the options that I talked about from Lucky was that she could rely on her Amoongus to try and get some of those spores down, uh, you know, buy herself some time to get the Xerneas on the field to get Geomancy up so that you can start doing what Xerneas wants to do and knows how to do best. Um, and if you know that your opponent is going to favor Gigantamaxing the Lapras, as we saw Mogar do in game one, and as mm -hmm. many teams who have uh, Lapras and Zashin like to do, you're not going to have any electric terrain around to stop, you know, the spores from connecting and putting your Pokemon to sleep. So I think that uh, Lucky had a great start to this game. You know, I saw uh, her looking for opportunities to get Xerneas out on the field, you know, looking for opportunities to support it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just unfortunate that while Lucky was focusing on her own positioning, Mogar was able to double down on the Lapras, you know, get those screens up, get those big damage down onto the Amoongus, onto the uh, Incineroar, and uh, also, you know, at the same time paralyze I think it was actually half of her team. So um, again, very well played. I'm excited to see how Lucky is going to choose to adjust. I think that she has to just lead Xerneas if that's the opportunity she's looking for. Because mm -hmm. even though you can't really stop your opponent from going for the G-Max Resonance, at least you get your Geomancy up and you're sort of breaking even when it comes to damage at that point in time. Yeah, you've got some way to kind of combat the offensive pressure on the other side of the field. But I really want to highlight the transition that Lapras has really gone through when we kind of throw our mind back to, I believe it was Series 5 is when Lapras really kind of came to the forefront. Um, it's gone through such a transformation. A lot of the time people then were running kind of shell armor to stop those critical hits. Water Absorb wasn't really a thing. And they were a lot more offensive with things like Weakness Policy and Life Orb. You did still, of course, still get the Light Crate Light, light clay variants uh, but i think people went for the more offensive pressure back then whereas now like you say people are going for water absorb the light clay's there just to have that extra bulk and longevity that can then help you out if you want to go for something like a perish song you're able to then stay and take the attacks and try and sort of take down your opponent's team in that particular way so it's great to see it here being piloted so well when it's got those great partners as well in the form of raichu and in the form of zashin it was great to see them kind of piloted together in the synergy that they can have on the field but i think Mal um, they were really able to capitalize well on the decisions they made with that Lapras. Going for that G-Max Resonance into the Incineroar that then turned out to be an Amoongus, then just forced Lucky to have to kind of switch out that Amoongus. That brought Xerneas in that took the big hit of damage from the next, helping hand boost the G-Max Resonance. And it was just an unfortunate uh, sort of turn of events there for um, Lucky. But the Pokemon are out on the field. It looks like it is the Lapras and the Raichu once again with the Amoongus and the uh, Xerneas on the opposing side of the field. You said you wanted to see the Xerneas, Gabby. Yeah, I did, and we're just jumping right into it. You know, I really like how eager these trainers are to get started on game two. Exactly, and the Gigantamax Lapras, always a pleasure to see. It's one of the most beautiful designs, um, and it's going to be here, ready to try and help out Mogar once again with that G-Max Resonance, particularly 
when you see an Amoongus there on the field, you want to get rid of that. And it's such a tempting thing for an ice type move to target down into. Xerneas just going to go for the protect here and the helping hand boost from that Raichu is going to be trying its best to pick up the KO against the Amoongus. But no, it's going to also be protecting. But the unfortunate thing here is it is going to be doing enough chip, I believe, through the protect to put it in range of that G-Max Resonance on that next turn. Even maybe without the helping hand boost, I think it'll be cutting it really fine. But there could be the opportunity for Malcolm to go for that resonance once again and then nuzzle away at that Xerneas. I really like how uh, Mogar prioritized damage on the Amoongus there. Had that Amoongus not gone for the Protect and instead tried to get a Spore down on the Lapras or the Raichu, that would have been a knockout. And I think that's exactly what you have to do in this situation. Uh, you know that the Raichu will have at least one more opportunity to go for an attack, assuming it's holding something like a Focus Sash. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can prior you can go for the uh, Nuzzle down onto the Xerneas at that point in time. Uh, but until then, because you can can't use max lightning to set up electric terrain or taunt or otherwise shut down the Amoongus is spore. You have to respect that threat. So very well played by Malcolm for turn one. I think going for the double protect by uh, Lucky was a good attempt to try and avoid like a fake out or something from, you know, upsetting the strategy overall, but still not not necessarily a priority for Mogar. Well, Amoongus could potentially be sacrificing itself here. The Rage Powder, however, does benefit the fact that the Xerneas is not going to be targeted by that Nuzzle. Amoongus able to draw it in, leaving Lucky Free to go for that Geomancy. And of course, with the Power Herbs, going to be able to activate that in one turn, as opposed to two, and boost up its Special Attack, Special Defense, and Speed. So this is exactly the position you want your Xerneas to be in. It's in its most formidable threat. And of course, Lucky still has not Dynamax either. So this could be certainly a very interesting turn of events for this Xerneas. The G-Max Resonance is going to come out once again from the Lapras. Not helping hand boosted this time. Is it going to be enough? Yes, it is. It is, but, you know, I find this really interesting. I feel like the Amoongus getting knocked out is almost a benefit for Lucky, as now she can send in her Incineroar and threaten the fake out down on the Raichu so that the Raichu isn't able to nuzzle the Xerneas. We haven't seen this Raichu use Protect at all throughout game one, and uh, assuming that it's not carrying it, I don't think a lot of people make room for Protect on a Raichu set in particular. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity for Lucky to prevent one of the situations from game one that really caused her a lot of trouble, those paralysis. Uh, and now, you're, like you said, Xerneas could also decide to go for a uh, Dynamax here and start hitting those max star strikes. If you know that um, your Amoongus has been removed from the field, it's almost better for you to set up terrain at this point in time because then you don't have to worry about those uh you know nuzzles mm. doing so much unfortunately it doesn't look like we're going to see that incineroar take the field instead it's going to be the metagross so uh an interesting adaptation from lucky and i'm curious if this means we're going to see the metagross attempt to dynamax rather than that xerneas yeah, that could certainly be an interesting turn of events. I mean, you've got to make sure you pick your um, Dynamax Pokemon correctly. And particularly if you maybe think that Malcolm does have that Zashin in the back, you want to make sure that you potentially can play around it. You've got a way to be able to take it down before it's able to inflict a huge amount of damage onto your Xerneas. And that could be another reason why the Incineroar is maybe hiding in the back um, so that it still has the potential to switch and want Zashin's on the field and use that Intimidate ability just to kind of bring it back down to neutral. But it is indeed going to be the Dynamax there on the Metagross. And this does give the opportunity to, although with the Xerneas you can set up that Misty Terrain, the Metagross can actually boost up defense stats and special defense stats through Max Quake or Max Steel Spike. And that Dazzling Gleam is going to do a huge chunk of damage to the Raichu. Not enough to pick up the KO, though, so it is going to be able to retaliate with that Nuzzle, something Xerneas does not want to see. The process could come in to haunt Lucky, as you mentioned in that game one. It could be a similar thing in game two. Lapras, however, going to go straight for that Metagross. Do, oh, just under a third of damage there. But I think critically set up that rain. That is just making sure that those Hydro Pumps, if they're able to connect, are going to be able to deal a huge chunk of damage and protects the Zashin when it comes into the field. But Metagross going to go for that Max Quake, removing the pesky little Raichu from the field, um, boosting up the special defense further on that Xerneas, but also giving it to Metagross so it can take any of those water type moves better than it just did with that Max Geyser. Yeah, and prioritizing the knockout on the Raichu so that no matter what happened there, Mogar was only able to get one paralysis down onto the field. So great optimization there from Lucky. 
even though Lazernius is paralyzed, like you were saying, it's not necessarily going to be the Pokemon of choice if you're assuming that Mogar has that Zashin in the back. And let's be real, even if we couldn't see their uh, perspective on the field, most people do bring the Zashin in the back. So um, even even though the Xerneas is going to be slower at this point in time, you know, Mogar is forced to recognize it because otherwise it'll just stay on the field, you know, keep going for those dazzling gleams and keep doing a decent amount of chip damage to the Lapras and to whatever's on the field next to the Lapras, even through the Aurora Veil. Vale. So I, I'm really curious what this Metagross is going to do now that the Zashin was revealed. I think this is exactly the... Uh, excuse me, exactly the board position that Lucky was looking for. Uh, it might be time to start going for those Max Quakes into the Zashin. I'm, I'm not sure how much damage they're going to do through the Aurora Veil, but if you can get the Zashin within uh, knockout range after a couple of hits, that's going to be pretty, pretty critical for this matchup. Well, the Behemoth Blade just going to go straight into the protector of that Xerneas. Lapras finding its mark once again with these Hydro Pumps, taking the Metagross down to below 50%. And like you mentioned there, Gabby, the Max Quake coming out from the Metagross, targeting this straight down into that Zashin. It does just over 50%, so we know that is potentially going to be in the room before a two-hit KO. And that's something that the Xerneas can maybe breathe a sigh of relief for. But the interesting thing here for Lucky, she doesn't necessarily have the switchability factor. You don't want to switch out your Booster Xerneas necessarily, and you don't want to switch out your Dynamax Pokemon. You really don't. I think you, at this point, you just hope that Metagross is going to be able to get that second Max Quake for the knockout on the Zashin and, uh, you know, then send in Incineroar to handle the rest. Oh, I love this animation so much. It goes straight down <laughs> into that Xerneas. No messing around by the best dog in the format. And it picks up a solid KO against that Xerneas, removes the threat. Of course, the Pralis is coming in there as well. A little bit unfortunate. Metagross is going to be taking some more damage and going for another Max Quake. So if this is going down into that Zashton, it's going to be able to really solidly um, pick up the KO here, remove it from the field. But I think for Malcolm, that Zashton did exactly what they needed it to do. They It did. It was able to get that knockout on the Xerneas, and you saw Lucky go for a second protect there. I really respect that play, because that was the only shot that Xerneas had to survive that turn, and had the 30% proc happened at that point in time, you know, it, it would be a much more comfortable position for Lucky. You know, to Lucky's benefit, when we saw her get down to two Pokemon the last time around, Malcolm still had, I think it was three or four Pokemon left, and was able to comfortably go for that Parish Song. Uh, that's not necessarily going to be the case this time around. And even though some Intimidates are being thrown around by both this mm -hmm. uh, Landorus and this Incineroar that are out on the field right now, both of these trainers are in a pretty... I would say decent spot just because the Lapras is being forced to rely on Hydro Pump rather than some other accurate water type move. And that Landorus will have to damage its partner if it wants to try and KO that Metagross. Well, no offensive move from the Landorus, just going straight for that Protect in the face of a fake out here. Um, Lapras going for the Hydro Pump and it finds its mark again. This is like the best Lapras ever. I know you said it clearly got all those ribbons from ho -Oh, but it is been <laughs> through the generations. It's probably been doing this for literal decades to be able to be so mastered in picking up those Hydro Pump accuracy. Um, I mean, what accuracy? It's just hitting every single one. And I think that really was the critical thing here and coming down to making sure that you can pick up the KO against that Incineroar. It doesn't matter now so much if the Lapras does get damaged because one Earthquake is all that Mogar needs to take to be able to advance to top eight. Yeah, and Mogar revealing that he has Protect on his Landorus as well there. I, I don't think that's something that we've seen so far. If the mm. Landorus Therian was one of those bulkier variants that run Assault Vest, you know, we would have seen that Landorus get flinched by the Fake Out and then most likely knocked out by the Ice Punch on the Metagross. Uh, or actually, maybe no, because the screens were still up at the end of that mm -hmm. game. So very, very well played by both these trainers. You know, I really like Lucky's team. But as I said yesterday, since it is such a tried and true formula, you know, especially if you're playing someone who's been around the block a couple times, as Mogar has, you know, they're uh, very uh, they're very frequently a part of the Oceania International Championships. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen them do very well there a handful of times. Uh, most likely very familiar with Xerneas, with Incineroar, with Amoongus, and just how that plays. 
um, you have to just be completely on top of your predictions. And it just makes the matchup that much harder when your opponent, you know, has these tools in order to uh, maneuver the field a bit better. But, you know, I, I don't want to count Xerneas out. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for it in Series mm-hmm. 8. Um, I think that it's just one of those Pokemon where it needs a, something something new, something to, like, freshen it up a little bit. Uh, maybe uh, Tapu Fini or some way to get that uh, misty terrain up so you don't have to worry as much about those nuzzles or uh you know sleeps or what have you but i do really love mogar's team even though it is you know lapras and zashin which i think has been one of uh the more most common archetypes mm-hmm. right now in series eight uh the raichu on the team really makes it something unique and special that. and something that mogar is proud of because i think he said this it is their mascot pokemon mm-hmm. I can't remember if you said that on stream or beforehand, no, but no, I think I said it both times. Uh, it would okay. be a mobile team if they didn't bring a Raichu, <laughs> whether it was Cantonia Raichu or the Alola Raichu. It certainly was Pokemon that they've really triumphed ever since it, they've been building their teams. Um, but I think I really want to touch on what you said there, Gabby, about the Xerneas, how it is still something that you have to watch out for. And particularly when it was Dynamaxed up, and I'm uh, sorry, it was Geomancy'd up, and I was like, oh, is it going to Dynamax? So, so my heart was in my mouth a little bit there because I'm like, this could be really, really strong. Um, particularly if it gets up that terrain, doesn't have to worry about the Raichu. But I think where Xerneas, in previous restricted formats where we've been able to have two restricteds, it's had really good partnerships, particularly with Groudon, for example. And yeah. now that it's lost that kind of really strong core partner, I don't think it's been able to find the balance as of yet. Whereas, like you mentioned, the Lapras and the Zashin combination has asserted itself quite formidably as a really good core so far in Series 8. And People will build counters to it and things like that, but at the moment, it's definitely up there as a front runner. So they've been able to find their synergy, but it's just Xerneas just needs to catch up a little bit, find its perfect partner. I I think it will, honestly. I mean, where there's a Xerneas, there is a team Mm -hmm. that will absolutely obliterate 90% of the format at some point in the time. So if you're a Xerneas friend or fan, don't fret. It will be, you know, just as unstoppable in the past at some point in Series 8 or maybe when we do have an actual, like, two restricted, more formal GS Cup (laughs) format like we've seen in previous years. Um, But congratulations to Lucky. I think that she played the team beautifully. You know, I Mm -hmm. felt like it was you know, you could tell that she was very comfortable with the team and very comfortable with the switches that she was making. It was mm-hmm. just unfortunate that the matchup just wasn't quite there. Yeah, and I mean, hey, top 16, that's still an incredible achievement. Um, and it's been amazing. I've been able to actually watch some of her like practices on her stream and things as well. And it's always a really great community to go and hang out in as well. So it's great to see her doing so well in this tournament. But of course, congratulations to Malcolm advancing to top eight. And I can't wait to showcase more of their Pokemon action later on in the tournament. Yeah, so I think it's time for us to take a quick break as we wait for the rest of Top 16 to wrap up. And we'll be back in a few minutes, maybe a little bit longer than that, uh, with a match from the Top 8 of the tournament. So thank you all so, so much for watching. Uh, Don't forget to check for the question of the round in chat after we throw the break. And uh, we'll be back soon. 